Um, and just before they get started, a couple announcements. Um, we are now recording these uh, and they are posted on the ASBMB website. So thank you to uh, Laurel Oldach and uh, Paul Dennis for, for putting that together for myself and John. We really appreciate it. Uh, and if you guys are um, new to the format, we're going to have two 20 minute talks uh, with questions. Um, everyone right now is muted, but we will um, open up the chat box for you guys to type in your questions. Uh, and when it comes time to uh, ask questions, uh, you will be able to unmute yourself to actually ask that question yourself. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off um, to Elizabeth Rideout, who's going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Liana Watt. Thanks so much. So um, thanks for giving uh, Leanna the opportunity to share her work in the lab today. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce her as today's speaker. And for those of you who don't know Leanna, I just want to give you a tiny little bit of background. So Leanna did her undergrad degree at McMaster University, and she actually worked with Ian Dworkin looking at sexual size and shape morphism in the Drosophila wing. So she's been interested in sex differences for a little while. And since joining the lab um, in 2016, Leanna has been an amazing driving force behind her project, where um, she'll talk to you about today, where she's provided some really nice insights into the mechanisms underlying sex differences in metabolism in Drosophila. Take it away, Leanna. Thank you. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. So I also want to thank Liz for the introduction and all the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So I want to start off by oops, I want to start off by talking about these widespread sex differences that we see in fat metabolism in many animals. One of the main things is that females typically store more fat than males, and this fat is distributed differently between the sexes. So males typically store fat in the abdominal region, leading to this apple body shape or what we call an android fat distribution. Females, on the other hand, typically store fat in the gluteal femoral regions or in the hips and the thighs. And this leads to a pear body shape, which we call a gynoid fat distribution. So in addition to sex differences and how much fat is stored and where it's stored, they also, males and females also store fat of different kinds. So males typically store more visceral fat, whereas females store more subcutaneous fat. The main differences between visceral fat and subcutaneous fat are that visceral fat is the fat that sits right up against your organs and is highly innervated, highly vascularized, and it's associated with an increased risk in developing metabolic disease. Subcutaneous fat, on the other hand, is sitting right beneath the skin, it's less innervated, less vascularized, and it's not associated with an increased risk for developing metabolic disease. Because of these widespread sex differences in fat metabolism, there's a whole body of work looking at understanding how sex chromosomes and sex hormones play key roles in creating these sex differences in fat metabolism. Specifically for sex chromosomes, there's a very famous mouse model called the four core genotypes. And essentially, um, you can have mice that are either XX or XY with either male or female gonads. So this allows you to look at the impact of sex chromosomes and sex hormones independently. So using this mouse model, they show that XX gonadal males have an increase in adiposity compared to XY gonadal males, indicating that the presence of two X chromosomes facilitates the increase in adiposity. Um, we also have individuals who suffer from Klinefelter syndromes, where instead of having XY chromosomes, they have XXY chromosomes. So XXY males have an increase in adiposity compared to their XY male counterparts. In terms of sex hormones, there's a lot of research looking at how they impact fat distribution. So when we look at postmenopausal women, they have a drop in estrogen, and this leads to them developing a more android body uh, fat distribution. We also see this in when we look at individuals undergoing hormone replacement therapy. Those taking testosterone typically develop an android fat distribution, whereas those taking estrogen typically develop a more gynoid fat distribution. So this body of work really shone a lot of light onto how sex differences in fat metabolism is created. But what's less known in this field are the downstream metabolic effectors that maintain and regulate this sex difference. So these are the metabolic genes and metabolic pathways acting downstream of sex chromosomes and sex hormones to regulate fat metabolism. And the Rideout Lab is really interested in this question. And the reason we're interested in this is because we know that fat storage, and specifically abnormal fat storage, is associated with developing metabolic disease, like type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease. And we also know that for these metabolic diseases, there is a male bias risk for their development. So to find these few 
proteins and few pathways that may be responsible for regulating the sex difference in fat metabolism, we needed to find a model organism that would allow us to do genetic screens easily and is also genetically tractable. So for that reason, we chose Drosophila or the fruit fly as our model organism of choice. In addition to that reason, here are a few other really important reasons why Drosophila is a great model for this. One of them being that Drosophila and mammals share the same reason, same ultimate reason, for why they have sex differences in fast fat storage in the first place, and that's for the purpose of reproduction. In addition to that, I mentioned that there's a lot of these fat metabolism genes in mammals, and all of them are conserved in Drosophila. Lastly, Drosophila have a short lifespan and are highly reproductive and relatively cheap. This means that we can do a lot of experiments with high sample sizes in relatively little time and for little money. So with that being said, the first thing that I did was to characterize any sex differences in fat storage and fat breakdown that we see in Drosophila. So here are fat storage graphs. On these graphs, we have percent body fat on the y-axis. And for the rest of this talk, orange will represent females and purplish blue will represent males. So what you can see here is that females have an increase in body fat compared to males. This sex difference is created over the first five days of adult life. So when Drosophila eclose, or at day zero of adulthood, males and females actually have the same amount of body fat. And over the course of five days, males significantly drop their percent body fat, whereas females maintain theirs. And this is what creates that sex difference in fat storage. This sex difference is then maintained until at least 30 days of age, which is about a middle-aged fly. So in addition to looking at fat storage, we also looked at fat breakdown. To do this, we exposed the flies to a lipolytic stimuli, starvation, and we collected flies at different time points post-starvation to measure whole body triglyceride levels. So in these fat breakdown graphs, the y-axis represents the change in percent body fat, the left half of the graph represents the change between 0 and 12 hours of starvation, and the right half of the graph represents the change in body fat between 12 and 24 hours of starvation. So what you can see here is that at any of these time points, females do not lose a significant amount of fat, whereas males do lose a significant amount of fat between 0 and 12 hours, as well as 12 and 24 hours of starvation. So altogether, this shows us that females have an increase in fat storage and a delay in fat breakdown compared to males. And this actually confirms to us that Drosophila is a really good model for studying this because these are the same trends in fat metabolism that we see in mammalian studies. So just to give you some context for how I'm structuring my talk, the first part will be looking at my published work where we show that Bremer is a metabolic gene that regulates the sex difference in fat metabolism. And for the latter half of my talk, I'll be sharing some of my current data, some unpublished work, on looking at a metabolic pathway called the adipokinetic hormone pathway and how it may also regulate the sex difference in fat storage. So the first thing that we did is we actually looked at a whole host of fat metabolism genes using qPCR to measure their transcript levels. So that data is represented here. Each bar is one gene. If it's colored in blue, it means that it was significantly male biased. If it was colored in orange, it means it was significantly female biased. And if it's gray, it means there was no sex difference. And what you can appreciate is that there's extensive sex specific regulation of a lot of these fat metabolism genes. Since we did see sex differences in fat breakdown, we also measured the transcript levels of all of these genes at different time points post starvation. And when we did that, one gene stood out to us because of its very unique profile, and that was Brummer, which is right here. So now I'll be showing you the mRNA transcripts for Brummer um, over the course of starvation. So in these spider plots, this vertical axis represents full change. And starting at the top, working your way clockwise, it's increasing time points post starvation. And what you can see is that at all time points, Bremer transcripts are male biased. But what's interesting is that in response to starvation, males pretty immediately and dramatically increase their transcript levels of Bremer, whereas females maintain a much more steady state. And I'll just reiterate that this was the only gene we found that had this specific mRNA transcript profile in, this, in both sexes. So since we thought Bremer was really interesting, we started to delve into what Bremer is. So Bremer is the Drosophila homologue of mammalian adipose triglyceride lipase, or ATGL. Both Bremer and ATGL catalyze the rate-limiting step in fat breakdown, where you break down triglycerides into diglycerides. And I just want to go into a little bit of detail about the protein structure, what we know so far. So at the C ter terminus, sorry, um, we have our conserved region. And in our conserved reg region, we have a patatin-like domain that contains the catalytic core of the protein. Following this domain, we have a Brummer box, and following that, we have this variable region that varies between the species. 
So there is a body of work that's already looked at how Brummer impacts fat storage. And what they found is that an increase in Brummer levels leads to a leaner phenotype, whereas lower levels of Brummer lead to a more obese phenotype. These studies though, were, when they were done in adults, were only done in males. And when we looked at the data, what we thought was very interesting was that it was quite reminiscent of our sex difference in fat storage, where males are leaner than females and males have higher levels of Brummer compared to females. So we had a hypothesis then that higher levels of Brummer in males leads to their leaner phenotype and their increase in fat breakdown compared to females. To test this hypothesis, the first thing we did was to look at whole body mutants for Brummer. So in these graphs, the lighter colors represent our controls and the darker colors represent our experimentals or our uh, whole body mutants. So when we start with fat storage, you see that our control animals have this nice sex difference in fat storage. And when we look at our Brummer mutant animals, we see that this sex difference is abolished. And this sex difference is abolished largely due to a male biased increase in fat storage. When we then also look at fat breakdown, we see that here we have our control males losing a significant amount of body fat between 0 and 12 hours and between 12 and 24 hours of starvation. But our Brummer mutant males are no longer losing a significant amount of body fat at either of these time points. I also haven't presented the female data here, but Brummer mutant females were no different from their control males. And you'll recall that females do not lose a significant amount of body fat in the first 24 hours of starvation. So what this tells us is that Brummer or ATGL is required for the sex differences in both fat storage and in fat breakdown. Since we were using whole body mutants though, we haven't um, narrowed down which tissue Brummer function is acting in to uh, regulate these sex differences. And as many of you know, Brummer has been shown to function in the adipose tissue to regulate fat metabolism. So that was a logical tissue for us to start with. In order for us to look at Brummer function in specific tissue types, we use a binary expression system in Drosophila called the UAS GAL4 system. In this system, we have a tissue specific promoter bound to a GAL4 protein, which is a transcription factor. This can then bind to the upstream activating sequence, which will promote transcription of a transgene of choice. In our case, we're using Brummer RNAi to inhibit Brummer function. So when we inhibited Brummer function in the fat tissue of flies, we saw that it actually increased fat storage in both females and in males. So what this means is that Brummer function in the fat is not regulating the sex difference in fat metabolism. So this meant that we had to kind of go back to the drawing board. Well, if it's not the fat, what tissue is it? So we do know that Brummer is expressed in a variety of other tissues, including the gonad, the gut, the muscles, and the central nervous system. So using our UAS-GAL4 system, we in inhibited Brummer function in each of these tissues and cell types, and we came across two hits. The first one is that um, somat is the somatic cells of the gonad. So when we inhibit Brummer function in these cell types, it actually had a male biased effect on fat storage. This is now a different project in our lab, so I won't be going into more detail about this work today, but I will be talking in detail about our second hit, which was in the male neurons. So when we inhibit Brummer function in the neurons, uh, we actually saw no impact on fat storage on either sex, so I haven't shown you that data today, but we did see a male biased effect on fat breakdown. So if we look here, these gray bars represent our genetic controls, and you see that, that these males are losing a significant amount of body fat in the first 12 hours of starvation. But when we look at animals that have Brummer inhibited in the neurons, we see that these males are no longer losing a significant amount of body fat. And if we move over to this female side, we can see the inhibiting Brummer function in female neurons had little impact on their fat breakdown. So now we know that Brummer function in post-mitotic neurons is impacting the sex difference in fat breakdown via a male biased manner. And this was a really, really interesting finding to us. And because it was so interesting, we actually had to go back and just double check a few things. One of which is, is Brummer normally expressed in neurons? To answer that question, we used an open resource called the Single Cell Transcriptome of the Drosophila Adult Brain. Using this resource, we, resource, we want to see if any of the cells in the adult brain were co-expressing both Brummer and a marker for neurons. So what you can see here is blue representing cells that are positive for Brummer, and in red, we see cells that are positive for our neuron marker. And you can see this plethora of purple points in, in the middle here, indicating that there are neurons that also express Brummer. And just to make sure that this was a reliable source, we also checked to see if Brummer was co-expressed with a marker for the glial cells. And you can see these glial cells are marked in red in these very specific um, separate clusters. And you can also hopefully see that there are purple points in here indicating that glia also normally have expression of Brummer. So now that we've confirmed that 
the neurons do normally have, have um, transcripts for Bremer. Um, many of you know that Bremer is a lipid droplet associated protein. So we wanted to then also check if these neurons normally contain lipid droplets. And as many of you can appreciate, this is a really difficult question to answer. But we were very fortunate to be able to collaborate with Dr. Michael Welty, who generously gifted us with this really fantastic tool called a lipid droplet targeted GFP. So for this tool, we use a neuron-specific GAL4 to drive expression of the lipid droplet GFP, specifically in neurons. And this will form green puncta, and these green puncta indicate lipid droplets in neurons. So here I'm showing you whole brain mounts. Uh, the top is a female and the bottom is a male. And you can see these green puncta in these regions of the brain here. So these green puncta are indicative of lipid droplets in neurons. And to confirm that these green puncta are indeed lipid droplets, we co-stained each of these brains with a neutral lipid dye called lipid tox. And when we do that, you can see that there are certain puncta here that are positive for both the lipid droplet GFP as well as the lipid tox. So this indicates that these lipid droplets are specifically in neurons. And to give you some reference, these purple puncta here are likely lipid droplets in glia. So again, this was super, super interesting to us. We see that Bremer is normally expressed in neurons, and we see that lipid droplets are also present in neurons. And we found that Bremer function in neurons is able to impact whole body fat metabolism in a male biased manner. So just to give you a quick recap of what we've talked about so far, we know that we found this one metabolic gene called Brummer, which is acting in a sex-specific manner to create sex differences in fat metabolism. So now we wanted to touch on, well, what metabolic pathways may also be playing this role. So we uh, looked at a few potential metabolic and hormonal pathways using um, our workflow from before, where we used qPCR to look at transcript levels for these pathways. As many of you may expect, we did find sex differences, a sex-specific regulation of the insulin pathway, but this is an entire PhD project in the lab, so I won't be talking about that data today. But what I will be talking on is we found this other pathway called the dipokinetic hormone pathway that showed sex-specific regulation. So on the left-hand side here, this is mRNA transcripts of the ligand, and on the right-hand side are the transcripts for the receptor. And you can see that for both the ligand and the receptor, it is significantly higher in males compared to females. So since we thought this was an interesting pathway to look at, we first have to figure out, like, well, what is the AKH pathway? So the adrenergic hormone pathway is the Drosophila equivalent functional homologue of the beta adrenergic pathway in mammals. The main differences between the Drosophila and the mammalian pathway are its ligand and its receptor. So in Drosophila, the ligand is the adipokinetic hormone, or AKH. In mammals, it's epinephrine and norepinephrine. These ligands bind to a G-protein coupled receptor in flies called the AKH receptor and in mammals called the beta adrenergic receptor. In both the fly and the mammalian pathway, this increases intracellular cyclic AMP, which ultimately increases lipolysis in the whole body. Again, though, there has been a body of work looking at how AKH function impacts fat metabolism in Drosophila. And this body of work showed that an in higher levels of M AKH transcripts leads to a leaner phenotype, whereas lower levels of the transcript lead to a more obese phenotype. And again, these um, experiments that were done in adults were only done in males. And we actually, when we looked at the data, thought this was really, again, reminiscent of our sex difference in fat storage, where males are leaner than females, and males have higher AKH levels compared to females. So our hypothesis is that higher levels of AKH in males leads to their leaner phenotype and their increase in fat metabolism. So AKH is synthesized and secreted by these neuroendocrine cells called the AKH neurons. So in order to test this hypothesis, we first decide to um, express a pro-apoptotic gene in specifically the AKH neurons to ablate them. And when we ablate the AKH neurons, we see that females do not impact their fat storage, but we see that males um, increase their fat storage. And this actually abolishes the sex difference in fat storage. I haven't shown you the fat breakdown data here, but it's the same trend where there was no impact in females, but males had a delay in fat breakdown. So we know that the AKH neurons is playing an important role in regulating the sex difference in fat storage. We also conducted the um, opposite experiment where we increased the activity of these AKH neurons by expressing a bacterial sodium voltage gated channel. And when we do this, we see that both females and males now have a decrease in fat storage. There is a remaining um, bit of sex difference, which is about 1%, and this is attributed to the female gonads. Again, I haven't shown you the fat breakdown data, but when we increase the activity of the AKH neurons, both males and females also increase fat breakdown. 
So we know that AKH is playing some role in regulating the sex difference in fat storage as well. So just to summarize what we talked about today, the opening goal of my project was to um, uncover metabolic genes and metabolic pathways that are playing key roles in regulating the male-female difference in fat metabolism. My published work demonstrated that Brummer, or ATGL, is this important metabolic gene that is regulating the sex difference in fat metabolism. And my current work is looking at whether the AKH pathway is a metabolic pathway that is also regulating the sex difference. The reason we're so interested in AKH is because it's the functional equivalent to beta-adrenergic pathway, and we also know that the beta-adrenergic pathway has sex differences, things like the type of receptors, the number of receptors, and how responsive they are to lipolytic stimuli. Altogether, one important takeaway from my work is that it is really important to study both sexes, especially when we're trying to understand how um, animals normally regulate fat metabolism because this will lead the way to being able to, de to develop better treatments for metabolic diseases for both males and females. So with that, I'd like to thank my lab, especially Liz for all of her support and guidance. All the postdocs, lab techs, undergrads, and grad students who helped out with this project, our amazing collaborators, Dr. Welty and Dr. Montooth, my committee members, and all of our funding agencies. So I'd love to take any questions now. Thanks so much, Liana. So we'll, I'll call out individual people and uh, you can read out your question. So the first question is from uh, Rafael DeMarco. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure, uh, that was a beautiful talk, thank you. Um, I was wondering when, uh, when you're doing the RNAi, a Brumer RNAi in the neurons, do you see lipid droplets accumulating or perhaps just not reducing in size in those males uh, with RNAi when you starve them? And I guess the question is getting on the, on the sense of like, are the lipids, uh, the lipid levels uh, being sensed by the neurons themselves or it's something else? Thank you for your question. Um, so the, for the first one about whether we looked at whether knocking down or inhibiting Brummer function in the neurons increases lipid droplets, we actually haven't done that specific experiment. But what we have done is we looked at Brummer mutant animals and looked at how many lipid droplets were in the whole brain or how, much, how many lipids were in the whole brain. So we do see that in Brummer mutants, there is an increase in um, lipids in the whole brain in both males and females. Um, your second question, Sorry, do you mind reminding me what the second part of your question was? I was, uh, it was kind of tied to the first part is whether or not it's actually the lipid levels in the neurons that are being sensed or if it's like something with the glia or something. And I guess from the whole animal, you can't really tell, right? Yeah, um, we, I don't have an answer for that question, but that is a really interesting point. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, the next question was from Dan Robin. Yeah, yeah, just a very quick one. So, and I think I missed this because I got a phone call, but so you see changes in Bremer or ATGL or you implicate Bremer and ATGL in, uh, um, uh, in this differences in obesity and you, and you see changes or you implicate AKH as well, the metabolic pathway, but I'm not clear how they're connected. How are the changes in, in Bremer or activity of Bremer affect the uh, metabolic pathway? Did you talk about that? Um, yes, so there is a different paper um, an, uh, that looked at how Bremer and AKH are working maybe either together or separately to regulate whole body fat metabolism. And actually what they showed is that Bremer and AKH, um, they are likely working in separate pathways. And I think there is, there is research showing that Brummer is not activated by the AKH pathway. So we're not making the point that AKH is specifically linked to Brummer. So we're, um, what my work has just shown is that one metabolic gene is Brummer and one potential metabolic pathway is AKH. But I also did mention insulin and insulin has been shown to regulate um, Brummer slash ATGL function. So someone else is doubling into that in our lab. Okay, thanks. Nice talk, very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks so much. So the next question is from Balat. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, so that was a great talk. Uh, I'm wondering whether there is any activity difference between the flies, uh, male and female flies, especially uh, comparing the mutants uh, with the Y type. 
Right. So um, we actually don't know. That is on the docket for us to test. So we will be testing um, if there's a sex difference in like the number of neurons, um, their projections, their connections, and their activity. No, I, I meant not neuronal activity, but physical activity. It's oh. like they're moving more, they are burning more uh, energy, this kind of thing. Yes, there is actually um, a difference. So um, in our paper, we did also, we looked at energy expenditure and we do see that females typically have a higher rate of energy expenditure. Um, I can't recall currently the direction of the sex difference, but there is a sex difference in the activity of flies. So there's a difference in how much they sleep in total and also how long each bout of sleep is and how long each bout of activity is. I'm sorry, I don't have the details of that right now, but there are sex differences in physical activity. Okay, thank you. The next question uh, we have from Petra Kienesberger. Um, hi, Liana. I hope you can uh, hear me. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, I learned a lot. Um, now, I, I had a question regarding um, ADGL activators and, um, and inhibiting proteins. I mean, the host has been identified already, at least in mammals. So have you seen any sex differences between um, a homologs of CGI58 or GOS2, um, if they exist in Drosophila? So we do, I think we know the coactivator in Drosophila, but um, we actually have not looked at the proteins that are interacting with Bremer and whether there are sex differences in them. Um, likely there may be, but I'm not sure. Thank you. Great. Um, the next question is from Graham M. Hello. Hello. Uh, so first, want to say great talk. Um, the your point about studying the different sexes, I fully one hundred percent agree with, and that's something that we need to move forward with. Um, but I was kind of curious. So, uh, in a slide, a few slides back, you were talking about how you both knock down AK, AKM and, or AKH, sorry, and mm -hmm. increase the levels of that. So I was wondering, mm -hmm. um, looking at that more specifically, did you measure or identify which lipids are changing? Like what uh, the composition of the triglycerides that are, are I'm assuming it's triglycerides, but mm -hmm. the composition that's changing? Or were you only looking at the total body fat percentage? Um, right, so we have not looked at specific lipid species. That is something that someone in audit is trying to work out, so how we can do lipidomics. Um, but to, I guess, clarify, um, we weren't increasing and decreasing the levels of the hormones specifically itself. We oh, were so. increasing and decreasing the activity of those neurons, okay. which we, would, yeah, presumably would increase their secretion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Joshua Pemberton. Hi, uh, excellent talk. Um, I was just wondering, given the differences in the fly model um, for development as well as sex-specific use of the steroid signaling system, if you looked at all whether dicerone or some of these other um, uh, steroid hormones were differentially modulating this fat storage. So we did start looking a little bit at dicerone. Um, I th one of the things we saw, I believe like Dyson is, there are papers that show that you can feed a Dyson to males and they do increase in fat. And I believe females have higher levels of a Dyson. Um, so that is, there is a sex difference in that a Dyson pathway, but um, we haven't fully flushed that out yet. Like this was a, this is a relatively new, pro the Dyson part is a new, a little bit of a new project in our lab. Great, thank you. Okay, and I think the last question will be from Michael Welty and then we'll wrap up to move on to the next speaker. Hi, Liana. Uh, that was really a wonderful talk. Uh, not only a great story, but you made it really accessible. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about this divergence uh, between males and females in fat storage, so that they start out uh, the same and then diverge. What do you think is the biological significance? Um, honestly, so our hypothesis is maybe it's something like maybe females are synthesizing more lipids, whereas males are not, um, or males are simply breaking it down and females are just maintaining it. Um, but we, we actually don't know. That is actually um, something we're really curious about. We want to understand how males are losing um, their body fat in the first five days and why they are, but females are not. So that is something we are interested in looking at. Great. Thank you.
Well, fantastic talk, uh, Liana. Um, and thank you from I'm, everyone. Uh, um, it was really a great, I'm sure everyone would clap and thank you. So I guess the next um, uh, talk, we're gonna hand it over to um, Julie, who's gonna introduce our next speaker, Jonathan Ma, uh, from the Hospital for Sick Children. And you guys are gonna hear about uh, some of his exciting work. Hi, before I introduce John, I want to just say thank you to John Burke and to Mike for organizing this seminar series. It has just been fantastic. Um, great way to learn lots of new things and uh, fantastic talks. So um, I'm supposed to introduce my students. So Jonathan Ma is a PhD student in my lab. Um, he came um, to my lab after getting a master's in Scott Kiss's lab at McGill. So he worked there on um, uh, cholesterol, efflux, and a little bit on the SED3 um, ortholog gulp. And while he was a master's student, he got really interested in membrane trafficking and um, came and interviewed and was excited about trying to do some genetics in flies. And I'm really glad that he did that because it's been great having him in the lab. And he's getting very close to finishing and will be going off to a postdoc probably in the fall um, in Fred Maxfield's lab, assuming that people are allowed to go start postdocs by then. So anyway, um, I'm just gonna turn it over to John now. Um, thank you, Julie, for the introduction, and thanks, Mike and John, for giving me the opportunity to share my work here. Uh, one major question in the lab we are interested in and how changes in Boston ties could affect animal development. And today I'll be talking about how PFOP regulates secretory granule biogenesis. So uh, secretory granules are organelles that are responsible for the storage and release of biologically active molecules undergoing regulated secretion. These include hormones, neuropeptides, digestive enzyme, and many, many more. Secretory granules are stored in the cytoplasm until the cell receives a signal that triggers their release, allowing these cells to respond to the stimulus very rapidly. Uh, to the right is an electron micrograph of a beta cell containing insulin granules, which are secretory granules containing um, for insulin. They are termed granules because they are often much bigger than secretory vesicles and they are electron dense rich in, on, in under electron micrographs. The biogenesis of secret granules first start at a transcultural network where um, the cargoes are sorted and brought up into immature secretory granules. And then these immature granules undergo remodeling and homotypic diffusion to become a mature secretory granules. In the field, um, much of the focus is on the bio, initial biogenesis and the secretion of the, the granules, and not much are known in the uh, me mechanism on how they are matured. And so in our lab, we use the larval salivary glands from fruit flies as a model system to tackle this question. Uh, I want to note that uh, in this cartoon, the secretory granules are depicted larger than the immature granules. However, this is not always the case, as in some secretory gra uh, granules, when they condense and remodel, they will get smaller. But this is the case for our system. So during the middle of the third instar level stage, the saloid glands starts to produce secretory granules that are known as glue granules. But they're called glue granules because they contain uh, many of these um, mucin-like glue proteins. So SGF3 is one of the mucin-like proteins, and we have a fluorescent version that's expressed under its own promoter. So you can see that its expression is developmentally regulated. In the mid L3, the, the expression starts to go on, and then it fills the entire glands in, in, in the late stage of the third instar larva. So during hormonal stimulated with a uh, ectisone stimulated preparation, the larva will secrete all the glues to stick the pupil case on a solid surface. And then, and so it allows it to stick somewhere during metamorphosis. So to the right are confocal images showing individual granules marked by SGS3 on, and in a single salivary gland cell. So this is one salivary gland cell and each of these um, fluorescent puncta uh, is the secretory granules. And when in late L3 where the granules mature, you can see that the granules are much bigger. So this is actually one granule and that is the entire cell. So you can see that the, uh, um, the abundance of these granules, they, they were really abundant and the differences in size are, are, are very big. So it is a good model to study how granules mature. 
So in proof flights, there are three PI4 kinases, um, the three A, three alpha, and then four alpha, which is the three beta, and, and the one single type two PI4 kinases, PI4 kinase. And PI4 kinases uh, phosphorylated PI on, on their first position of their inositol ring to generate PI4P. So out of the three PI4 kinases, two of them have Golgi localization, which is PI4K2 and PI4K2, uh, which and four drive. And when we examined the mutants of these flies, uh, we found that uh, only PI4K2 gave a phenotype in secretary granule maturation. So you can see that the granules are much smaller compared to wild type. We were able to rescue this phenotype by putting back a uh, functional transgene. And when we examined four drive, we see that they don't, they don't they don't have a defect in, compared to pf 4 2 So this is to look at the distribution of pf 4 localization of pf 4 in the cells. So pf 4 2 localized to transcogen network, and which is shown here that it partially partial co-localized with uh, the Golgi marker. And it also localized to RAP7 positive late endosomes. So you can see here that it, uh, it overlaps with RAP7 and it forms these um, uh, membrane tubules that's emanating off from the, the late endosomes. So when we examine the, the phenotype further, we see that uh, not only the cells have small granule phenotypes, it is also accompanied by an incre increasing RAP7 size. Um, so we see that the RAP7 endosomes are enlarged and occasionally the, the glue cargos will be, the, the glue protein cargos will be uh, mislocalized as well. So here we're looking at uh, PI4K2 mutants, now mutants, and then we put in back either functional PI4K2 or kinase that version of PI4K2. So um, on the top, so we see a suppression, a, re, a rescue of phenotype, and the granule size are suppressed is basically wild type, and then we see the deformation of the, the tubules. However, with kinase uh, that PI4K2, we don't see a suppression of phenotype and suggesting that the kinase activity is indeed important for granular maturation and the production of PI4P is important for this process. So when we put, back, put in um, kinase diversion of the pi 4 2 we see that they decorate these enlarged endosomes instead of forming tubules. So when I joined the lab, um, because four drive doesn't have a phenotype, we, I'm thinking that as a simple hypothesis is that PI4K2 promotes granular maturation through its endosomal activity instead of its Golgi. So um, I started the experiment by having a candidate RNA screen where I screened uh, many endocytic trafficking machinery and also uh, PIP regulators, kinases, phosphatases, and then uh, cytosecond regulated proteins. So I screened about 254 genes and I had 80 positive hits. So for positive hits, they're here. Uh, indicated by two and three, where the granules are much smaller compared to control, which is indicated as zero. And I would like to mention that PI4K2 has a score that's more similar to two or three. And we drove these RNAIs in a tissue-specific manner, so, so we only knocking down genes in the, in the salivary glands because many of the trafficking genes, they are essential. So um, the primary, the initial screen was overly successful. So out of the 80 hits, uh, I have 48 hits that's endocytic, and they, they have, uh, they range all the way from things in, needed for endocytosis internalization, like AP2, through uh, many of them as involving early endosome function, and early endosome to late endosome transition with escorts and um, covalent hops. We have a few hits from uh, ARO-related genes. So ARO is lysosome-related organelles, which um, there are another type of secretory organelle that the origin comes from the endosomes and then they acquire Golgi materials. And we have a few like retrograde trafficking genes and um, things involving lysosomal function. Uh, but today I'll be focusing on PASS1, which is the uh, Drosophila homolog for EHD1 and Syntax N16. So because um, the initial screen was overly successful, I need to narrow it down. And I decided to use a marker to examine whether any, all of these genes actually had uh, a defect in endocytosis or in the endocytic pathway. So I try to turn my hand into a mammalian marker called CDCC3, which is a tetraspending and it has four transmembrane domains. So I, I like to use this because it, it is secreted to the plasma membrane through the biosynthetic pathway and then it's re-internalized and delivered to lysosome. So I can 
see whether there is a defect in, in engine safety trafficking. CDC-83 is also uh, found on lysosomal related organelles, it's a, it's a big player, and it's on LROs like melanosomes, alpha granules, biopolity bodies, and many more. However, to my surprise, when I put in the mammalian C3GP in flies, I found that they decorate secretive granules, and they actually have activity at promoting granule maturation. So here we have uh, granules with zero copy and an increased copy numbers of the transgene, and you can see that the granule size increase, and in the, in the two, with two copies, the, the granules are abnormally large. To the right are uh, quantification, looking at their cross-sectional area, and you can see that there is in, there's an increase in size. And then at the bottom here, it's just showing the distribution. So it, has, it shifts the distribution to a larger um, secretory granules. So it suggests that CTC3 then has a function uh, playing a role and to confirm that um, I try to knock down the Drosophila homolog, which is a TSP29 FA. And so we knocked down and we showed that the, the granules does, uh, the granule sizes get perturbed and it's, it's smaller compared to wild type. And we were able to suppress this phenotype, phenotype by uh, expressing the mammalian version that is not uh, affected by the RNAi. And to the right is the quantification showing that um, the granule size are indeed smaller compared to wild type and then it's getting suppressed. So because CDC3 has um, activity at promote granule matura maturation, so then I think uh, I wanted to see whether um, all of the hits from the primary screen, like the initial screen, whether any of them are required for CDC3 to promote maturation. So I did a secondary screen with the RNIs and the CDC3 GFP. So here are just some examples where they suppress. So for AP2, uh, CDC3 overexpression suppresses the, the RNI phenotype. And for RAP5, it, it has a partial suppression where the granules get a little bit bigger. But we also have hits where it makes these things worse. So for example, R1, small GPAs, and, and then it is, uh, it's a much smaller, uh, and it's much worse. And interestingly, there are uh, some that it failed to suppress, suggesting that CDC, these genes are needed for CDC3 to promote granule maturation. And one of them is PF42. So when I express the transgene in PF42 mutant, it doesn't suppress the phenotype. And, and the, the two other genes that I noticed are syntax 16 and PAS1, where they failed to suppress the phenotype as well. So it's suggesting that these three genes may act in the same pathway and they may be needed, they, they are needed for CDC3 to promote granular maturation. So a brief summary so far where we identify three, uh, two genes that acts potentially acts in the same pathway as PF42, uh, and they are needed for CT33 mediated ma uh, granule maturation. Um, based on the literature, PAS1 uh, and 16 are both involved in retrograde trafficking. However, um, they've shown that PAS1 it, um, has its activity at the early in the zones, while our data suggested that PF42 acts, acts at the late in the zones. So I wanted to make sure, want to um, double check whether PF42 has an early nosome activity in, in our system as well. And, like, it was showing in mammals, but uh, we haven't, we're not sure whether it's the same in flies. So then I turned into a PI3P marker to label early endosomes, uh, so using the 2X5. And so in the mutant, we see that uh, early endosomes are enlarged with whole endosomes that we, we barely see in, in controls. And, and like the late endosome phenotypes, it also occasionally has uh, uh, granule markers being mislocalized into these hollow endosomes. And to the right is the quantification. So then, then next we look at its localization and uh, activity. So we look at, we're putting in kinase that pf 2 in control and mutant background. And so in the control, it localized to early endosomes and formed these uh, membrane tubules like what we've shown with RAP7. And in the mutant, however, there's a reduction of, in the number of tubules and we've seen these increase in uh, clusters of hollow endosomes. And to, again, and to the right are the quantifications. So since now we established that PF42 may act in early endosomes, we, I was wondering whether PF42 uh, 
would mediate a trafficking of CDC23 from the early nosome to uh, either the secreted granules or the TGN. However, I could I didn't never observe that in live. I never saw like CD3 traveling on these tubules. However, I do see that uh, mcherry pf 2 occasionally like so these tubules occasionally touches uh, CD3 GFP coated granule membranes, and you can see they're pointed by the arrows. And to the right is just colocalization analysis where I showed that there's no um, correlation between pf 2 and CD3 GFP overall. However, they do overlap slightly by looking at menders. Um, so if I look at how they overlap, um, uh, mo most of the pf 2 signals contain CDC3, but this is not true, vice versa. So since there is no uh, strong evidence on how uh, CDC3 is trafficked by pf 2 we're wondering whether six, is there um, a relationship between CDC3 and its product the PF42 is, which is PF4P. So we're using the biosensor uh, 2XP4M, and then we do find that they're, they're highly colocalized on the granule membrane. So, so uh, CDC3GFP and MCHERRY2XP4M, they're both colocalizing on the granule membrane. So to see whether PF42 is needed for this uh, distribution of PF4P um, to the granule membrane, we where again, we're examining the 2XP4N in PF42 mutant background. So here is a wild type where we see uh, PF, PF, PF4P on the granule membranes. However, uh, this number is, is significantly reduced in the PF42 mutant. So the granule size are smaller and, and then there's very few uh, granules that has PF4P uh, on their membranes. And to the right is the quantification. So we see about, uh, so, so in wild type is about 100%. So most of the granules have it, and in the mutant, it's roughly 40%. So now we established that PF42 is important for this distribution of PF4P onto the security granules. We're wondering whether the hits that we identify through our CD63 secondary screen actually affects PF42 dynamics. So to look at this, I, uh, we express GFP PF42 in the PAS1 mutant and the Syntaxin 16 INI. And indeed, we see a significant reduction in the number of tubules, and we see that pf 2 also has more of these enlarged endosome decoration in both the PAS1 mutant and Synexin 16 RNAi. So we want to see where the dynamic of the tubules are being affected. And uh, here is a video showing that the control pf 2 tubules, they are very stable and they, they extend or retract very slowly. However, this is not a case in the PAS1 mutant. So they, it, without PAS1, um, the, the tubules become less stabilized. So I think that could be affected. It, it is uh, ability to, 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 uh, for retrograde trafficking. And to the right is a quantification on the average velocity of these uh, tubules to show how stable they are. So since PAS1 affected um, PF4K2 activity, where they're wondering if this has similar phenotype as PF4K2, where the PF4K2 distribution, distribution on the secretory granule membrane is affected. And so we look at the PF4K2 bio, uh, PF4P biosensor in j 2 xp 4 m P4M again. And here is showing that indeed, so the granules are small, and indeed the, the number of granules having PF4P on them is reduced. And more interesting is that instead of having the PF4P on the granule membranes, it accumulates on these hollow endosomes. So which is consistent to as our observation because pf 2 is still present in the cells and then they're making more PF4P at the endosomes. So in summary, in summary we have identified CDC3 being important to promote granular maturation and it needs pf 2 PAS1, and syntaxin cysteine to, to mediate this, this, uh, this, this function. And uh, PAS1 and six, syntax, and 16, six, six, syntax and 16 are regulating PF4K2, uh, presumably in the retrograde trafficking. And, and um, it is in, they're important for the distribution of uh, PF4P onto the secretory granule membrane. When we get rid of PF4K2, um, granules fail to mature. And we see in large early zones that occasionally have uh, granule markers in them. And, and we see a strong reduction in 
and PI4P on immature supercritical granules. It is similar with PAS1. Uh, when we get rid of it, uh, we see similar phenotype, and but instead, because PI4P2 is still present, we see an accumulation of PI4P in early endosomes. So I think in summary, we have identified normal regulators of PI4K2 in, in regulating its process activity in retrograde trafficking and uh, the ability of it to redistribute PI4P in, in the cells. So finally, I want to thank Julie for her um, guidance and all the people who in the lab who have worked on this project. And I'd like to thank the people who uh, share reagents with us and the funding sources that allowed us to com uh, complete these experiments. Uh, thank you for listening. I'd like to take questions now. All right, thanks, John. And I guess um, I am going to start calling on various people to ask questions. So the first one is from Ganesh Shelka. Hey, hi. Thanks hi. for the talk. It's a great one. I have a quick question regarding the expression of CD63 uh, in mm -hmm. the granules. So CD63 is a classical extracellular vesicle marker. Mm -hmm. You see, so have you looked into that aspect of it? Uh, whether the granules that are secreted are coated with CD three sixty three? So we we haven't, um, but there are labs who look at um, the secretion of extracellular vesicles, um, but we personally we haven't. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Thanks. All right. It looks like there was a question from Amy Kiger, or more than one. Amy. Hi, wonderful talk, Hi. congratulations. Um, I was wondering about um, two questions. Um, prior to the regulated secretion, do you have any evidence of the PI4K2 role in other, other, the other retrograde trafficking in a similar pathway or changes in localization that coincide with the mm. increased demand for this granule production? Kind of curious on that switch between um, doing L3 and these salivary glands um, and how kind of more homeostasis situation versus the regulated secretion um, um, PI4K2 function may change. Okay. Um, actually, I'm not sure. Um, we're not sure. So, but, but then the tubules are not as extensive in the earlier stage. So mm -hmm. there may be less of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, just in terms of tissue specific expression level, um, PI42 mm -hmm. are highly expressed in the salivary glands, so maybe that mm -hmm. also plays a role in there, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you know anything about what recruits PI4K2 um, to the endosomes? To the or, endosomes? Um, there are data showing that the PI3P depletion is important in the mammalians, um, and then to bring the PI42 on, um, and also um, I think the membrane composition could be important as well, like how, whether there is uh, cholesterol, cholesterol or not, because it's, it's pulmonary Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. There is a question from Shandamal. I don't know if I'm saying that right. <laughs> Shandamal? I don't know. Yeah, you said it right. I was wondering, since uh, PI4K2A is responsible for the uh, phosphorylation of PI4P, uh, mm -hmm. if there is a, a change that you see for the PIP2 lipid uh, when you get rid of the PI, uh, PI4K2A? Um, that's a really good question, but we, <laughs> we have never check, checked, uh, so, so we don't know. Um, but there are data in other systems showing that uh, uh, having increased level of PI4P in the endosomes could lead to increased level of PIP2, and that would affect um, autolysosome formation and stuff like that. Okay, we, have, we, have, we have not personally checking our system. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks, and a question from Josh Pemberton. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, sorry, just a lead in before my question here. Is 2-alpha, is it palmitoylated in Drosophila? Uh, I actually, I think the, the sequence is conserved, but we never really checked. <laughs> yeah, so we just assumed that they are yeah. because that sequence is con in conserved. localization uh, become a bit more interesting, especially as you mentioned related to PI3P, but 
yeah, it's just interesting if it's in fact um, uh, how it's being trafficked there. Anywho, mm -hmm. my, my other question was, is whether or not you looked at changes in calcium, um, sort of related, I guess, to the, the PIP2 levels, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I haven't. Yeah. yeah, okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. And it looks like Tamash Bala has a question. Yes, hi. This was a great talk. Uh, given the, the big hits in the endocytic pathway, uh, is it possible that what happens here is that some important component that is important for the maturation of these uh, granules mm -hmm. is not recycled back properly? Yeah, so, so part of the more ambitious goal is probably to identify what is really important being trafficked. Because I, I do think that it is, like you said, that uh, retrograde trafficking overall could be just in being important. And, um, and maybe there are a subset of the retrograde trafficking that's important and some are not. And, and, and maybe like what is being trafficked could be important, um, but we, we don't know what uh, that is yet. Um, and it could be CD3 itself is like tetraspinin because it, it uh, tetraspinin is known that they form microdomains that's cholesterol rich. And perhaps that it helps the increase in cholesterol level in, in the secretory renals as well, because that has been shown that uh, cholesterol concentration, like there's a gradient and, and cholesterol composition is really important for these granules uh, in general. So that could be a thing, but we don't really know what is specific that's important. Yeah. Thank you, great talk. Thank you. It looks like Chris Stefan has a question. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I was wondering about potential roles of PI4P on the tubules or generating the tubules. Mm -hmm. So did your screen identify any known PI4P binding proteins or have you uh, observed any PI4P binding proteins localized to the tubules? Uh, I haven't seen PI4P binding proteins on the tubules, but on OSBP, which is a PI4P uh, binding protein that mediates cholesterol transport, is uh, important for the process, it's the same process, but it is not, uh, when I look at the localization, it is not on the tubules. So it's probably, it's in its roles of facilitating cholesterol transport is important instead of like going onto the tubules. Yeah. All right, any more questions? I don't see any popping up. I think that is it. So let's uh, thank uh, Jonathan and Liana again for two wonderful talks. Um, thank you. Um, and we will see everybody um, back here next week, hopefully. Remember, the talks are being recorded, so we will be posting them uh, online soon. Um, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Have a great weekend.